start recording welcome back welcome back um okay <laughs> uh, i just want to give you a short warning two of my colleagues had earlier today problems with zoom where suddenly their zoom session totally collapsed and they were not able to reconnect um, so in case something like this happens i will record everything and uh, put it on studium but my hope is of course that we don't have any problems um, we will see though um, yeah we will see i have prepared i think most of the things here and uh, yes i wonder i mean i'm certainly used to connecting this stuff together and also used to having the tools open on just one screen normally um, now i have two screens in front of me but since i also handle all the zoom and the cameras and everything it seems that there is a risk of things getting chaotic i don't hope so um, scream if there is anything that i'm for example showing the wrong camera or i don't know what um, and uh, what i want to do today is to go through the different steps from lab three the instructions are on studium the all the necessary files are on studium and uh, yes let's see what i what what, what we can do here um, sadly enough, I was, I, I thought I might have some time in between the lecture this morning and then now to perhaps put up some uh, additional questions on item pool or something like this. But uh, yeah, and then these two hours went away like nothing as well um, with administrative stuff this time. So let's see what I have here. Um, I actually tested something that's why you actually see uh, numbers running up on the screen back here in binary they are actually produced on the microcontroller here and sent to putty we will see this in a little bit and uh, this was just a test that most of the things work so what else do I have here I have sorted some of the cables from the project box um, the short green cables are out of here. I have green cables, I have white cables, I have blue cables, and I have red and black cables. I have this one here already connected, but I will start from scratch according to the instructions with this one here. It's twin brother. So let's disconnect this one here and get rid of it. So if we look at the instructions, um, this one or this one no this one transition um, then here you have first the picture of how the different uh, things are found or where they are found on the board itself so here we have the real board and here we have the picture we are mostly interested in the first column uh, just now wrong sorry <laughs> The first column here just adjacent to the pins, which actually is the pin So someone Hannes is not seeing video. Eric is v seeing video. Um, okay, that that's possibly the beginning of zoom problems. I don't hope so um what about everyone else apart from hannes do you see my hand moving here my virtual hand okay 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 yes yes good 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 so if something happens if something freezes for you um, please let me know immediately but uh, the recording is independent of zoom so uh, that should be fine then anyway 
And my hope is that uh, you will get these kits here soon and then you can do the experiments yourself and uh, then you might go back to the video and, and see some details or something like that. Um, okay, so, so the first column here directly adjacent to the pins, that is the position of the pins in the corresponding GPIO registers. So over here on the left side we have port B with pin 0 to pin 7. Here we have port D from 0 to 7. Then we have port C 6 and 7 and port F 0 to 7 with a lot of exceptions in between. There's no 2 and no 3. Well, it's not that many exceptions. It's two pins missing on port F. Um, but we will work with port B and port D today. And if we scroll down here, the first micro project as I call them in the lab instructions is to actually have a look and see that we can read out the current status of an, a GPI open from the code which we write. And uh, for in order to print binary numbers there is actually a function which could be used ready in C which is called um, E to A, integer to ASCII, it's listed further down and you will also find it in the snippets file. But uh, here I decided to write my own short uh, print binary function, which just uh, takes, for example, an 8-bit number and actually puts out its 8 bits as zeros and ones and sends them actually over USB as a text. And this is essentially what was running in the window over here. I cannot point the mouse to the right, but you see this window here um, behind or in front of the mouse cursor. Um, no, you can't because you are here. You are, you are seeing this actually. Sorry. See, this is what I mean. Um, so I'm talking about the wrong window. So <laughs> here uh, you see still the numbers and here you see my print binary um, very primitive function. Um, it more for clarity than it was meant to be um, efficient but it goes through the individual bit of a binary number and prints them out. We will test this function first and see how it works and for that actually we need to start the only window which I haven't started yet we need to start an Atmel Studio and I will do the work today in Atmel Studio in order to um, yeah, for, for me it's currently still the least hassle uh, to do so. Essentially it's just about compiling the code, so the code is ready-made already. And in Atmel Studio I will create a new project as soon as I'm asked to do so. Um, so here we have the new project and it should be a GCC C executable project, so the second from the top and I call it 2020111010 lab lab 3 something like this i will use the same project for all the code today so i will overwrite the code later on um, it's nothing i want to save for later it's just yeah for these different projects micro projects so here we have it, wait a second, then it switches over, then I switch back to the source code. And this is the prepared source code um, by Admin Studio. And in Programmer's Notepad here, I already opened the three example files which I put up on Student Portalen. So, or Studium, sorry. So what I will do now is I will actually copy yeah, let's start with copying most of it, but not everything. Oh, I, I copy everything. So I, I mark and copy away with this one. Control A, Control V. And so now we have the new code here, including all the libraries. Apart from io.h, we will also need standard io.h. Um, yes? You see only part of the screen. I see that. Yes. 
Uh, I see that. Um, let me fix this uh, quite quickly. Um, better. So now we see the. Now, now it's something on the on the right hand side is gone, but uh, that's not so critical. Um, well, actually, it is. We will need that soon as well. Um, okay. <laughs> Whoops. Um, I can. I, yeah. Well. Well. Let, let's see first what the code which we have here. So, um, CP, FCPU eight megahertz here or eight million tells the compiler that our CPU is running at uh, eight megahertz, which is defined by our board. So it's nothing which we can change in the software, at least not easily. So it runs at eight megahertz, and we tell the compiler that this is the case. Um, standard io.h uh, we need for for some uh, I don't even remember which it was I think it's my s print f here which uh, comes from there and you see there's even a bug in the code which I gave you <laughs> um, then we have the USB print binary which is supposed to be printing out binary numbers over the USB port and uh, it uses functions from an external library, the m underscore USB transmit char is actually from an external library. And also the is connected and the, M U the USB in it, everything this is from an external library. Um, here actually I forgot to put a USB underscore in front of it because this is a call to my own print binary function here, which I called USB print binary after I tested the code. Um, so what this is supposed to be doing is actually it will, and this is the crucial part here, I defined a variable data, an 8-bit unsigned integer, uint8, with a name data, and inside our infinite loop, let's separate this a bit out as well, I read the contents of the variable. It looks like a variable. It's a special variable which is con directly connected to the hardware in our microcontroller. It reads the value of PIND, which is actually the input. So you can split it into three parts. Port input D. So this is the input register where all the eight bits from our port D are represented uh, and we can read back the current value of it. Um, when you normally when you hover the mouse above it you will actually get some while well, you can uh, I cannot hover and click at the same time. What it will do then is actually take this number and send it through my USB print binary and so it should show up on the in, in the window here to the right. Um, and it will also then print out a space. And it will, thanks to the sprintf, which is also documented in the uh, snippets, will also print out the decimal value of data so that we can see both the binary and the decimal number, which is um, given up in or read from the port. And uh, then actually the, these two lines belong together. So sprintf creates a string with this content, which is then sent to the USB by means of the USB print function, which is also defined up here because interestingly enough, the original library didn't have something like a standard print. Uh, so I just print out a standard C string here to the USB port. Um, then we wait for a certain amount of time. It says 200 milliseconds here, and then it will go through the loop once again. But since we are using an external library, we also have to tell our uh, compiler that it should actually read in this external library. Um, and in order to show you how this is done, I will actually move this window over here. And this is different between Atmel Studio and Platform I.O. And of course, compiling from the command line. So in Atmel Studio, what you want to do is in this 
box here, which is the Solution Explorer. You have the name of your project and you right click on the name and then a context menu opens uh, where you actually have <laughs> it's going to the wrong direction here. Um, I want well, you have the add function here and it says over here to the far right on my screen, add existing item. I will click on add existing item and I get a browser window where I now am supposed to find my libraries. So I didn't store them where I store everything else. I stored them actually under our course pages here. So we go to courses, we go to um, microcontroller programming, we go to year 2020, we go to labs, we go to lab three and we go to files. <laughs> so here we, we see this resource course files, uh, code one to code three. And here we see the three libraries for using the USB, um, which I borrowed from another university. And so we say add, we mar I marked all these three and now I add them to our project. And then they actually show up here um, just above our main.c file. So these files are now visible for our C compiler as well. And they need to be. And now I go back here and make this window big again. And the whole bar to the right will disappear. And now hopefully everything should work when I compile it. Um, Let's see. Or it shouldn't. Perhaps it shouldn't. Um, would be nice to have actually some errors. Um, interestingly, it tells me that FCPU is not defined. So I got a warning down here. FCPU is not defined, which is a bit weird because I remember actually putting it here. Define FCPU. That is interesting. Uh, is MUSB-C also using delay.h? No. Is mgeneral using... Ah, okay. They import it as well in their uh, general. Mm, okay, it should work. It should still work. There's a way around it, but it should still work. Um, that was interesting. I didn't see the warning yesterday and actually if you recompile warnings normally disappear which is also a bit tricky. But now it said one succeeded or up to date zero failed zero skipped. Um, yeah so now what do we have? We have code which should be uh, programmable into our microcontroller. In order to do so I have to connect the board to um, the USB port. In the instructions it also says that I should connect the ground pin, which is the pin furthest up here, to the rail which goes here just for convenience. Um, we can also try to find the plus 3 volt which is down here and connect this one to the other rail. Also for later on we will need this. And we have another ground on this side here, which I connect up. And we have another 3.3 .3 volts on this side here, which is this pin here. And this goes here. So the description of the pins you have in the, in the graphics, um, but you have also a very short version here directly on the board. So you only need to look up on the board, which pin is which. Now we want to program our code and in order to do so we have to put the programmer into programming mode by double clicking. And uh, then actually when double clicking we should see that our programmer comes up as a, a, a serial port on our PC, Mac or Linux computer. So what I opened here now is actually the device manager um, uh, just to see there should be between portable devices and print queues down here. There should be a new um, item sh popping up once I double click here which is ports. 
everything disappears and it reappears and we have ports and before everything ends here it says com7 was the number of the port of the programmer uh, now actually the eight seconds timed out and it's back in its normal operating mode where there is no usb port uh, available or no serial port so yes Because uh, when we reset it, we put it into bootload mode. And only in this modus we can uh, put new software into the microcontroller. In an Arduino, this is done when you actually upload code um, in Arduino. Then actually the microcontroller is set into uh, this programming mode by software. But this needs to have the Arduino loop running all the time and checking if the host PC is wanting to communicate. So there's a task in the background running in all your Arduino sketches, checking if you want to program something new, um, which is actually stealing performance from your microcontroller. Uh, so, so in this case, we put it into this reset by actually triggering a, a reset by using this button on the board itself here. It's just a different way to, to enter the um, bootloader. Actually, the bootloader on the Leonardo and on the Micro uh, works exactly the same as well. So it, on, on these, as long as you run the Arduino framework, there's always a piece of code checking if your host computer does want to communicate and upload new firmware. And uh, while here right now, this code, which is running and blinking this LED in this pattern, um, it doesn't check whether someone wants to communicate with a USB port and uh, do something. It only does what it should do. And this is only blink the LED. So it, it's, uh, it's the way it is for, for this particular microcontroller. If you look at other embedded systems, for example, uh, the STM32, there you also have to actually put it into this bootloader mode manually. There is no way to do it just by software. So uh, then we, we need, as a next step, we need our uploader and I will use um, Ava do this. So I just dra drag the window in here. And uh, currently um, it says still COM7 here, but currently the list of available ports which I can choose from are USB, LPT1, LPT2, and LPT3. Um, there is no LPT port on my computer, so I actually don't know where these come from, but I couldn't choose COM. But once I press the reset here. Then during the time it's active, I can actually choose COM7 here. And now I have to find my source code. And this is not the correct source code, or the, not the source code, the, the compiled file. And this should be the in, in the 2020 11, 10 lab 3 catalog here and then under debug and then here we have the file which the, which contains the compiled code and i choose this file now and if i now go into programming mode again because everything has timed out as you heard from the bump um, now i can program the code connecting to programmer programming flash memory um, three point 3382 bytes of flash uh, programmed and verified and if we look here this is exactly the same number that our compiler gave us here as the size of our compiled code and uh, now actually what should be happening is that our microcontroller here should now try to send data over the USB cable to the computer because that's what our code told it to do. Um, still, this window doesn't say anything and this is because this window is frozen. So I have to... It seems awfully complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> it 
Um, so if, if I if I go to and open the putty window, it says that uh, error of writing to serial device uh, because actually COM5, which it used to have here, disappeared. Um, the question is which USB port or which serial port are we talking about now? And in the device manager, we have now permanently a COM port, a USB serial device COM5 appeared. COM7 was our programming device. COM5 is now the device the virtual device through which our microcontroller is communicating with the PC. So selecting COM5 in PuTTY, I need to, uh, or the easiest way for me right now is a new session here. And I just uh, go and there, there's different terminal programs on different computers. This is just a serial terminal for us now, but Putty is a very famous and, and practically usable one uh, for Windows. Um, I choose COM5. The speed doesn't matter because it is not a real serial port. And I open it. And uh, actually now you see the numbers coming here in this window. And you also see them in a slightly increased size popping up to the right here above my head, over here. So now actually it's very hard to see that there's something happening because it uh, writes the same number all the time. And these are all ones. Um, it would be nice if I could have my finger in front of, of this. So, so we have actually um, eight ones and this translate to decimal 255. If I now take a wire and connect it to ground and then connect it to the highest bit of port D, then actually we see that nothing changes. Who is stuck? Who is stuck? Someone is trying to call me. Good luck. Um, for some reason, our microcontroller or and some something seems to be. Ah, no, it's not. It it was me. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, well, what, what happened is actually I didn't connect it to ground, but I connected it to um, 5 volt from the USB port. So it's not stuck, um, hopefully. Exactly. So if I, if I connect everything correctly, we see now that the highest bit is reset. And instead of uh, 255, it puts out 127 or 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. If I go to pin number six, then we see that there's a zero coming in on the second bit from the left or on DB5 or DD5 on the third bit from the right, uh, left, left. Um, fourth bit from the left, fifth bit from the left, bit number two, bit number one and bit number zero so we we can actually see how the um how our c code can from the inside of the microcontroller see what we are doing on the outside so if i start to actually put all of the bits to zero here by connecting all of them to ground we see how one bit after another is turned into a zero. One more. That's bit number five. One more. Bit number six. It's getting crowded here. And one more, which is the last and highest bit. And now I put it wrong. Here is the right hole. So now we are getting zeros back. 
So in order to actually read zeros, uh, we actually have to... I, I know that you cannot see the code in Atmel too well. Um, that's why you have the uh, code separately on, stu on student or studium and, and can see it in better um, resolution. But this switching between the code window and the camera, I couldn't do with screen sharing in Zoom, which would give us the higher, highest quality of the screen transfer. Um, I hope that the code is still somewhat legible even on the screen here. And same for these numbers popping up here. Um, so now we can actually see what happens if, if I remove the the least significant bit here and leave it hanging in the air and then actually we get a one on this position and uh, if I do this with bit number two or actually it's, it's bit the, the second bit is bit number one um, we see it has a value of two um, and it, it is seen. So why do we have to connect the pins to ground uh, as I did here in order for them to show up as zeros? Why is an open wire like this interpreted or seen as a one and there are two things to this one thing is that actually um, i activated the so-called pull up resistors on the microcontroller if we have a look here the first command here port d equals 0b 1 if we have port D as an input, as we have right now, then actually this activates a pull-up resistor for every single of these wires, which will make sure that if the wire is disconnected or the port is disconnected from the outside world, then it will read back a 1 and not a 0. So an open input in general is very often in digital logic seen as a logic 1. The problem with these chips would be that if we just have these wires hanging in the air without an internal pull-up resistor, then actually they would catch random disturbances. And I can show you this as well. I now disconnected the lowest four wires here. And I will go into the code and deactivate the pull-up resistors by just commenting out this line of code. If we do so and recompile the code and re-upload the code, I have to find the right window here. So I double click and say program. No, I wasn't really in the program. What? 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 Hello? Okay. I have no idea why it hang. Um, I will disconnect from the USB and reconnect to the USB cable. I will then give it a reset. It shows that it is in bootloader mode. But for some reason COM7 doesn't show up. Uh, I'm confused. It also doesn't say broomp. This happened all this, this never happened yesterday when I tested all the code. Um, <laughs> it is in bootloader mode, but the COM port doesn't show up on Windows. Um, okay, let me try a different USB port. doesn't help. 
actually very weird. Uh, there should still be the port available now because it should still be sending data. So it's not a zoom problem which caught me here. It's actually a different problem with my computer. My computer doesn't want to play with me anymore. Um, is there anything else stealing the COM port? This would be very bad for us now. And this would be even worse if it happens to you um, once you have the boards and uh, don't know what to do then. Um, all I did was disconnect these wires. Okay, let's put these wires back to where they were. Like this. No USB. No action on the USB. Um, hmm. Okay. I'll have to investigate this further on and debug this problem later. Um, for now, I have uh, around 60 more of these programmers in my, or the, these breakout boards in my office, so I can. Ah, 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 oh, oh, oh. I didn't do anything. Windows just woke up. And it's back playing with me now, it seems. No, it's not. No, Windows is still not playing with me. Okay, I try. Before I remove this board out of the socket here, I actually disconnect the USB hub on which everything is sitting. Perhaps it was the hub or the USB cable somewhere. Ah, this, this sounds better. Yes, and now we're at COM9 for some weird reason. Um, uh, okay, programming. I have no idea what the reason was, why it hang itself. Um, I could imagine that it was somewhere in my chaotic USB cable um, wiring here under a lot of paper. I have a cable going from my computer to a hub uh, or USB hub, which then goes through the green cable here because I have other things connected to the same USB as well. Um, hopefully this will never happen when you are doing experiments. Um, hopefully, hopefully. It seem, everything seemed so stable and fine um, so far. So um, what I have to do now is actually restart my um, putty session here and most probably it will not be COM9. It was now talking on COM5. Oh, COM5. It's still on COM5. Okay. Going to putty, we say COM5, so we say just restart this session. And uh, now we read zeros again, as we did before. <laughs> I need some water. Um, so we, we see we have the same zeros coming up here, but now I have only pull-up resistors on the higher... No, no, I have no pull-up resistors at all active. So if I disconnect the blue wires here now, what we will see is that we see random numbers popping up instead of a stable 0 or a stable 255. Now actually it's stabilized at 0, but I just have to touch the board with my finger and you see that we get all kinds of uh, bits active or not active on this port because they are not held up to a logic one level by these pull-up resistors inside. So if you have an open input, don't leave it hanging open. Activate the pull-up resistors and uh, then actually you can pull each individual pin to zero by your external circuitry. For example, also by our switches which you will find in your box 
So these are small push buttons. And uh, how do they work? Uh, they are not in the description for this lab yet, but uh, for, for the next one we will see them. So I connect one side of the switch to ground and the other side to one of the pins on the in or one of the pins on the input of our microcontroller. I will try to re-upload the code with the pull-up resistors activated. So I get rid of the comment here, recompile the code and transition and hopefully I'm now able to just upload the code as usual. I will That didn't sound like a double, no. Okay, now it sounded like a double, yes. Huh? Program. <laughs> program. Connecting to programmer. Programming. Something is again getting very slow. Someone of you tipped me that I actually should restart my computer um, from time to time and it helped recently. I actually closed all the unused windows right now, but something is still open, which probably apart from recording also takes some processor power. But I think the recording also takes some processor power. At least now um, I once again have to restart the putty session because it always loses connection when I go into programming mode and we see that we are back at the um, 255s getting in here and if I now press this button which looks exactly the same as this button um, then we see that actually one of the bits goes to zero and if I release a button it goes back to one and if I press a button it goes to zero and if I release it it goes back to one. So this is how we can actually read information from the outside world into our C code. And as you can also see if we have a switch button now connected to one of the pins then it's actually only this pin which changes. So one question which uh, we can think of here is how do I filter out the information of just and exactly this pin from all the other pins? And the answer to this is logical operators. So in this case I would actually use a logical AND to filter out all the other bits around it. Because if I think of the binary number which our switch is con currently connected to, so um, we see that it's 0b, pressing the button, 4 once, then 1, 2, 3, 4, then comes the 0 or 1 and then come three more. So this is where our push button is. And we are only interested in this single bit. So what can we do? We can actually use a logical AND together with this number here. A logical AND works by actually and we have two bits a and b then the a and b gives us only a one if both bits are one so in this case the result will always be zero where we have a zero in the second number but where we have a 1 in the second number, it will, us, it will give us exactly the information which this bid corresponded to. So let's, before the break, just add this into our code and see how it works. 
So instead of printing this binary number here, I will actually take a logical end with the number 0 binary 1111. No, sorry. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. This should filter out, mask off everything else except for this bit position. Does the switch button need key debounce? In software, most probably, yes. Um, not for us here and now, we will not see it bouncing. And if you actually have a delay like me right now, waiting for 200 milliseconds before I go through the loop again, I will not see bouncing of these switches. But in general, yes, these switches are bouncy, which means that when they make contact, um, they actually do it like this. So instead of going just and closing, actually they might bounce up and down a couple of times, which could actually be interpreted as a couple of uh, closings and openings. And you can do this in hardware by actually adding a small capacitor or in software by just uh, waiting until it stabilizes, which is normally within 10 milliseconds or so. So they are, they are quite fast, but key debouncing uh, is something which in a real world project or um, application you definitely want to do. So let's compile the code. And, and yeah, I, I, I showed, <laughs> sorry, I didn't show the, the bouncing. So what I, what I showed, wanted to show is that when you press a button, this is what happens. It closes a couple of times before actually being closed. Um, and that was because I was showing you this window instead. So let's try to upload this code and see if we are lucky again. So putting it into reset, that sounded nice. Nice double bing. And uh, now actually it uploaded. And now we have to restart our putty session. There's probably only so many times before putty will crash. And uh, so what we see now coming in, in our window here, is, I want to see this in bigger as well. Okay, I only have it here. So we see four zeros, then a one, and then three zeros. And if I now press this button, actually we see that it goes to zero. And uh, instead of eight, we get zero. Um, so perhaps this position was a bit yeah, awkward because uh, the eight is very probably not as easy to distinguish from a zero on your screens. Um, we could actually move it to the 16 position instead. So I move the wire upon one position um, higher up, which means that I should do it like this and recompile the code. And now I'm looking for the next bit to change. And I will find the right button here and I <laughs> I will find the right button here. Program the code. And this worked well without any further problem. And restart putty. Okay. Restart. And now we see that it's the number 16 which comes here. And we have a one at the position number 16. And if I press now, the button then it goes to zero and now it's 16 and now it's zero. So if you wanted to check whether this button is pressed now or not, you would check whether it is zero um, or whether it is not 16. Um, so this way you can actually have code which actually reacts on a key press and you see it well almost live reacts here, but uh, we only have five readings per second anyway. Okay, let's have a break. I need to drink some water and uh, let's meet again. It's, it's already five past, so let's meet again 20 past uh, to continue. I will be back in five minutes or so to discuss and yeah, then I will, now I cannot change. I will not start my email program. I want 
this computer to be running as low resources as possible right now. Um, yes, but I need to drink something. 20 past, we continue. This one here and this one here and mute you and mute the All of my colleagues seem to be zoomed out right now as well. Still running.
Yes? No? <clears throat> it sounds as if someone has switched on a microphone, but I don't hear and actually... No, I don't know. No one has. It's just Zoom making noises, okay. It should be bouncing. Yes, I could show the bouncing. You said the bit is, but why the output is. I actually, Sushao, between uh, this and then this, I swapped this wire and everything one position to the left um, because I noticed that on a screen like this, the number eight is very difficult to distinguish from the number zero. So in order to show the difference between 16 and zero is much more clear. So I switched everything um, one position to the left. So, so I removed a position here. And now we have a situation where the code actually also looks like this. Um, that's, I mean, when, when you do things live, things like this happen. It just ended up as a random number, which was not the optimum number. Um, yeah, the call which I missed, actually someone wants to sell me, of course, something. Nolhutrefemab wants to sell me something. Yes, no. No, no, not interested. Here is Ninja, Browser, Properties, OBS Ninja. Where is my yellow trace? How is everything set up? I have no idea. Have no trace, trigger, edge type, slope, yes. Okay, it's 
not triggering. Mode, trigger mode auto. First at least. So yes. Okay, five volts per centimeter. Two volts per centimeter. Okay, looks nice. Need the green channel. Get rid of it. This one, one more volt up. Okay. And let's see. Twenty, hundred microseconds, perhaps. Still looks quite okay. Two hundred, okay. And now trigger. Falling edge. I'm playing around with the oscilloscope here on my desk and I want to show it to you in a second as well. And no audio here, thank you. And the other camera, thank you. Okay, let's say start here. Say start. And here we have now a new code. Q B eight X seven V Enter. Okay. Not there, there we are. Okay. So here you can actually see uh, the yellow thing there is a USB hub which I was talking about earlier. So from there one cable goes under this heap of paper to my computer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a mess. And, and then this is how the rest of my desk looks before we get to where the rest of the setup is. And uh, but what I wired up here now is actually the oscilloscope is measuring the voltage at the pin of the switch. So if I press the button down, then actually it goes down on the oscilloscope. So this is a logical zero, and this is button released is a logical one. Logical zero, logical one, with a lot of artificial delay in between. And now what I want to see is whether I can capture the bouncing of this switch. So in order to do so, I want to trigger normal, not auto, and I press the switch. There, there well, it, it was first when it went back. But uh, so I only released the switch once, but actually you see that there are two uh, signals generated by the switch now. First this sharp spike here, then it goes back to zero and then it stays at one. We have 500 microseconds per centimeter. So, all, so two centimeters is a millisecond. Um, so within this time, the transition from 0 to 1 when releasing the switch is uh, finished. I try it now again and press the button. And uh, no. Actually, apart from little noise, additional noise, which I get here just prior to pressing, um, I don't seem to get any bouncing on the way down, at least not a significant bouncing. Ah, uh, well, here, here we have something, uh, some little spike, which could actually um, lead to a problem in our software. I mean, just imagine, yes, this is one millisecond, and actually our microcontroller will execute 8,000 instructions for two of these squares. So th this 
is a couple of hundred instructions fit between the first ramp down and then this small spike which you see down here. So it's definitely possible that our software could do an or could produce an error by actually reacting to quickly to something like this. So the second part of today's lab instructions they are about these multiplexed LED displays and uh, let me see where well, we go here yes transition so this morning I showed you um, already this diagram type here where you see LEDs connected in this pattern where actually each of these blocks corresponds to one digit on one of these displays. The display which you will find in your boxes looks like this and I just uh, preliminary put it onto this second board here in order to make the cabling a bit more visible when filming it. Um, actually everything fits nicely onto the board next to each other if you connect it on the long board which you have in your boxes soon hopefully. Um, so this display here has the connection which is actually shown here to the right. Uh, yeah to the right. So we have six pins on either side and uh, these are connected well according to this diagram here and what I've drawn here is actually on the outside of the package where we want everything to go. So I will just follow these and connect it together um, together with you um, on this board here. So first I will get rid of my oscilloscope lead here and I will actually switch off the oscilloscope. We don't need, uh, we, nah, I don't know. We don't have, probably will not have time to look at the signals. I don't know. We will see. Um, so now we are back at the board itself. And what we want to do now is actually if we swap back, we want to have eight resistors between the pins from port D and the corresponding pins of our LED. So these are the current limiting resistors which are drawn here for each A, B, C and so on of the LEDs. So we have segment A which is the top, then we have B, C, D, E, F and G. And in our display, actually, we don't have the middle dots, but we have a, an eighth LED, which is the decimal point, um, which we will also wire up. Whether we use it or not, we, we just connect it. And so what I do is I take my eight resistors, I pre-bend the legs of them, and I will put them next to each other onto the board here in the middle somewhere. One, two, three. This must be as exciting as watching paint dry. I don't know. And I mean, if, if this was pre-recorded, I could fast forward. So every one of you watching this um, later on, you could fast forward and uh, see this procedure once it's done this leg doesn't want to go in here ah <laughs> um, for, for some reason this leg is a bit bent um, i have an unbender here as well like this okay oh, works better this way so how many do we have? We have five, three more to go. 
this is supposedly number six go in here number six number seven and number eight so as i said these are supposed to be connected now on one side to the pins of port d so we swap back to our sketch here um, so pd0 pd1 pd2 pd3 pd4 pd5 pd6 and pd7 so again it's utter chaos on where these segments end up if you just look at the numbering here or the naming on the pins we have segment a f b e d h c and g um, it was most convenient for the manufacturer to place the pins like this and now we have to um, yeah unwrap everything so that it looks nice and fits so what I will do is I take these blue wires here from D0 I go to the first resistor from D1 I go to the second resistor from D3 no I'm at D2 first to the third resistor from D3 to the fourth am I in the camera view yes I am in the camera view and this and this and this and I lost the blue cable here's the last blue cable because I counted them beforehand so I know that I had eight of them so this is our port D connected to the resistors and now from the resistors we want to connect to the um, yeah, to the cath no, to the anodes, sorry, to the anodes of the um, display. And so I take the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight white cables, which I have here, and connect them from D0 where's d0 going d0 is going to pin number two of the led i didn't put it all the way down i don't know if you can see it but you have the six pins going here so if i press it completely down then it's very hard to see where the actual pins are so i, I leave it a bit out here so i can see where the pin is going so the d0 goes to the second pin from the left on the upper row like this and then we have d1 which we have here which goes to the last pin of the upper row then we have where do we have pin d2 pin d2 is on the lower side the third pin from the right which is this one here go in here Oh. <laughs> I'm also limited a bit with my head so that I don't bump into the camera which is hanging here <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's not perfect but we'll make the best out of it so then we have what where we where are we pin d3 pin d3 goes to the second from the left on the lower row uh, then we have d4 d4 goes to the to the leftmost pin on the lower row go in there don't be shy Okay, like this so reconnect it up here then we have d5 d5 is upper row again and the one next to d0 now i bumped into the camera but it still seems to be quite okay there go in there <laughs> and we have d6 where do we have d6 d6 is the second from the right on the lower row the second from the right on the lower row is here and we have one more wire one last wire to go 
and this would be d7 and d7 goes to the middle of the lower row well the oh, the unconnected middle and goes here so this is all the all the plus poles connected <laughs> yeah it's a mess um and now we have the green cables here. The green cables are then supposed to be our port B pins. So looking up what we want to do, and we want to connect the fourth pin here, the last pin to the right on the lower row goes to PB2. Then we have PB3, PB4 and PB5. So let's do that as well. So we have the last pin on the lower row here, which goes to PB2. B2 we have here, and then we have B3. As you saw, I have slide, I picked the longer green wires, and the color might be completely different in your bundle of wires. They are random in color and in length but you have 65 of these wires in your box so that should be enough for a lot of connections we have been using 16 here so far and now we're adding another four for 20 and then there's some more wires which we already have since earlier uh, so pb4 goes next to here in there pb4 is here and then the last one goes from pb5 to the outermost pin on the upper row here like this done so here are our connections <laughs> hopefully so now we need some code and uh, the code will have to actually define both port B and port D as outputs. Not all of the pins from port B have to be outputs, but all pins of port D have to be outputs. And then we want to actually show some numbers by actually activating one of the digits and a certain number of the segments. So, each of these is called a digit and then each of the individual LEDs is called a segment. The code for this is also, well, the first code. You can, you are then actually very welcome to experiment with this code later on and do modifications and see what it does and try out things yourself. Um, but the first code here is ready-made uh, in the file code 02 on Studium. And uh, <laughs> get drive and app updates from Lenovo. No, absolutely not now. Thank you. No. Um, no. Shut up. I don't want to update drivers now. I'm in the middle of a teaching session. So I copy this code and I go try to find my Atmel Studio here. And uh, what I will do now is just uh, Control A, Control V, completely replace our previous code with this new code. And uh, so I'm switching on all the pins of, D, of port D by the data direction register DDR, nothing to do with Eastern Germany, um, DDR D, by setting a one here, I define a port pin as an output. In this case, I have eight ones here. I could also write this instead of binary. I could have written this as uh, 255 in decimal, or I could have written it as zero XFF in hexadecimal. Um, I could write it in octal as well if I was only fluent in octal. I don't do that, um, so I put it back into the binary form that it was, because for us it's perhaps more clear now. DDRB, we have connected the LED digits to PB2, PB3, PB4 and PB5. So counting here from the left, this one would be PB0, 
PB1, PB2 is a 1, PB3 is a 1, PB4 is a 1, and PB5 is a 1. So these four 1s are our green wires going from the microcontroller to the LED display. Then I actually now remember that actually the LEDs are connected so that the comments are the negative sides. So by putting a logical one onto PB5, PB4, PB3 and PB2, I'm putting 3.3 volts on this side of all the LEDs and that means that none of the LEDs can show up and light up because this upper side here has to be a lower voltage than the lower side because we have the anodes, the positive sides, pointing down in this display. So by writing this line here, I set the pins in port B by actually using an OR, I, I will for easy for, for easy understanding, I will just leave it as this one. I just put ones at these positions and then they will be all off. Then I have a command here which actually I, I wrote a comment here which actually shows which segment goes to which bit just to make it a bit more clear and easy to understand which bit is which here. And so what I'm doing here is I'm switching on segment A, B, C and D and G. So going back to this view here um, and remembering that we have A, B, C, D, E, F and G, what I will do is turning on this this LED, C will be turned on, D will be turned on, and G will be turned on, and we should see a number three, hopefully. But only if we also make sure that one of the commons is connected to zero. And I will take away this AND here and also show you the, the simple code first. So now I have here this binary pattern which is one 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 zero one one so there's one zero one digit is connected to zero volts in the end and these segments will be connected to 3.3 volts and then i have an empty while loop so there's nothing more happening in here once we have done this our microcontroller will happily uh, run in this endless loop here um, forever and uh, shouldn't do anything anymore. Um, but since we don't change anything, we will actually leave the display on. So I compiled the code and it says that this code still needs 1350 bytes of our memory and this is because part of our USB libraries are still in here now. Um, I didn't remove those, um, I don't have to, it, it's okay. Um, uh, we also need somewhere, we need 11 bytes of data memory. I'm not using any data memory here, so it must be in the USB libraries that there's a global variable or several global variables needing 11 bytes of memory. So the code is compiled and uh, hopefully I can now just uh, go and uh, upload it with program here. Um, but I will switch over your view to the camera uh, so that you can see whether or not we will see something on this display. Okay, it's programming, it's programming, it's programming. And yes. I don't know if, if yeah, the, the contrast is perhaps not the best, but we see there's a three on the last digit here. Um, one trick which I did earlier with a similar display is uh, you can actually cover it with something red and, and then you see the number a bit better. Um, this is because the light gray 
of the non-lit segments under this camera is very similar uh, to actually the <laughs> lit up segments. Um, hmm. Do I have some other red foil which I could have, which is somewhere in between? Yeah, no, this is too too shy. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think you see um, this. So what if I wanted to move this one position to the left now? One, what if I want to actually have this three on this position instead of this position? So we go back into the code. And remember that actually it is the digit here, which is controlled by port B. So now we have a zero on the number two here. I add some comment. So this is bit number seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And we, we see that we have a zero at position number two. So PB2, switching over to the next slide here, PB2 is connected to the rightmost group of LEDs. PB3 is connected to the next group of LEDs. So what we just need to do is to move the zero one position to the left in our code. Like this. So now it's here at position three. I recompile the code, switch you over to this view, and hopefully there's nothing wrong with the reset now. Has been working quite well so far, again. It was only stuck there in the beginning, and I wonder if this has something to do with the Lenovo message about new driver updates available, that something actually um, messed up in the background and Windows updates stuff. But we were able to move the three, one position to the left here. And uh, what if we want to show a different number? Um, let's say we want to show a number two. What we would have to do is actually get rid of the C segment and instead turn on the E segment. So we can do this in our code. So instead of the, and, and we, we remember it is this part here, so the contents of port D, which controls the segments. So I take a zero at position C, and instead a one in position E. And I recompile this code. I switch you over to this view here and I'll do the reset. And I, I, I lost my area do this quick, quick, quick. Yes, still got it. <laughs> and it's a number two. Yes. Um, yeah, here. And so we can actually go along and actually output stuff one digit at a time. As you can see, we, well, I can try. Um, let, let's try what happens if I turn on two of the digits as, at the same time. Um, we go back into the code view and I turn on the digits, these two digits. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. The digits are here. So the digits. Of course, now uh, the comments don't update automatically here. Uh, so the comments are not valid anymore in the source code. Um, I compile the code. I switch you over to the camera view. And I try to find my area do this. So I'm ready. Double click. Program. And yes, now we, we have a 22, but um, we can only show same numbers this way because we, we cannot show different information on this digit as this digit if we are doing it like, like this. So what we have to do is we have to time multiplex our display. 
so that at some point in time we show something for the first digit then for the second then for the third and then for the fourth and then again first second third and fourth and uh, this is done in all the as I, as I said this morning in almost all displays we are using of this kind um, we use time multiplexing uh, for example is my phone still transmitting yes it is is my computer still receiving yes it is wow so let me just switch over. first i make some space here so that you can see something and now i switch over that you will see something so down here oh wait take away my fingers down here i have a frequency generator and if i have if i switch it on we have actually a frequency display here so these are these uh, led displays and these are multiplexed these are time multiplexed so only one of these numbers is shown at a certain specific time um, this camera is too slow to pick it up uh, as different uh, lit up segments as is our eyes so and i've actually no idea why it's hopping like this it shouldn't be hopping like this if i can if i switched it correctly and not trying to measure and external frequency it shouldn't be jumping like this i oh wait it could be on sweep mode i don't know i cannot see that right now yes it was sweeping okay so now now it's a stable 900 kilohertz signal which it generates um and uh, yeah but it's showing just one decimal at a time again chaos view transition back so the third code snippet which is yeah i i, I possibly could this this camera phone doesn't have this uh, this this flexibility um it's it's a rugged ule phone um it has a decent camera but it doesn't have a good camera um so i i yeah um but our third code slice which we have wait a second that was that was the correct camera angle here um so the third code here actually does something like this um let's just copy the code and then analyze what it does so i copy the code we have the fcpu 8 megahertz and the delay function as usual oh, sorry as usual i have a field here an array with four elements um, which i call frame buffer and uh, these look like random binary numbers uh, to me so far and uh, i switch on the uh, port d and port b pins as output as before and then i have now something happening inside the while loop including a certain time delay down here and let's uh, just see what happens if i compile this code and let us see if it compiles without error it compiles without error so i will move you over to this view and then you are the witness of the first witness to see what happens if i upload this new program code okay so these wires are a bit in the way in the middle it says zero one two three or actually three two one zero if we read it as a decimal number um, but it's quite slow and this is because we have a delay of 500 let me put you here instead we have a delay of 500 milliseconds between each of these segments it's this here so this is a for loop going through the segments from zero to four and then shows this 
Um, actually, what I want to do now is I le let me run it backwards through the numbers here so that it will actually run in a more logic direction on our display. So if I turn around this for loop and start at 3 and leave it running while it is still larger including 0 and now I will actually mess up myself because it is defined as an unsigned int so I will change it into an int and instead of i++ I run an i minus minus and uh, if I thought right now and you can watch this later and see in, in more detail what I did um, I switch over here I put this one into programming mode I program the new code and I expect the numbers to go in this direction now but still 3 2 1 and 0 so the numbers themselves haven't changed it's just the sequence in which they are shown on the screen which has changed so why is it a 3 why is it a 2 a 1 and a 0 well, let's have a look in the source code. In this field here, which I called frame buffer. And here the first one it reads as 0B00111111. So counting from the back, I write this one down here 0B00123456 ones and I swap you over to my screen here. Um, so this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G and decimal point. And so what does it mean if we turn on A, B, C, D, E and F? Well, A is this segment, B, C, D, E, F, G. So all of them apart from G are turned on here and this means what we are showing is actually a number zero. So this binary number gives us a zero. In the lab instructions I have made life easy for you and actually put up a standard representation of the nine numbers actually you cannot see all of them right now due to uh, eight and nine being behind this stupid thing there but you see the corresponding binary code down here you could also of course write it out down in decimal or hexadecimal if you want to um, on the other hand nowadays well, since our compiler can read binary numbers and we have plenty of space available, um, actually binary numbers might be fine in this context. As I told you earlier, there's a reason why we use hexadecimal uh, numbers because they can be easily translated from binary to hexadecimal and back and they are more compact and you're possibly less prone to actually make errors when copying these numbers because here you now have to count the zeros and the ones or like this one here zero one zero one one zero one one for a two um, if you want to just write this once more uh, yeah you can copy and paste from the pdf file here but uh, it's, it's easy to actually type out wrongly but if you think that this in hexadecimal would be five three um, that's quite easy to remember when writing the code. Not, not remember from today to tomorrow, but uh, from actually when you prepare the code to when you write the code. So for a 2 we have 0b0101011. This is the number 2. And then showing you once more how we get from the binary number to hexadecimal we take the two groups of four bits here where this one here is one times two to the power of zero plus one times two to the power of one so this is a three and here we have two to the power of zero zero times two to the power of one 
plus 1 times 2 squared and this is 4 plus 1 or 5. So this is the same. Here quite easy if you have to write down 8 numbers, uh, 8 zeros and 1s uh, or 2 more familiar numbers. Yeah, there's an, there's an advantage to writing either or and you will see me also using yet a different notation later on. Yes, uh, we, we define not CPU but we define FCPU and uh, this is actually, uh, let, me, let me answer this directly here. Um, so it, you have seen it in all of the codes so far that I define, this is then a macro so for our compiler, every time our compiler encounters the four letters F underscore CPU, uh, it will replace it with 8 million. And uh, this is because the code inside of delay.h actually is dependent on, uh, well, yeah, I'm yeah, what, whatever. Um, <laughs> well, actually, actually, yeah, interestingly enough here, I, I just found a row where it actually says directly FCPU. Um, so uh, our delay functions need to know how fast our CPU is running. And here we tell um, the, the um, delay function how fast our CPU is running. If we remove the delay, yes, let's try that. And this is actually the last thing which we will try today. Um, so first I will shrink it down to, let's say, 100 milliseconds. Um, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, what, I, what you didn't see in the background was actually that I opened the delay.h library here by actually right-clicking on delay.h. And inside delay.h you have a, a, yeah, I don't understand this code. I, I don't want to bother with this code. But the thing is you see fcpu showing up everywhere there. So our delay functions are based on that our compiler knows what speed our CPU is running at. Um, no, we, yeah, actually delay.h will complain if fcpu is not defined. Um, uh, if, if FCPU hasn't been defined by us, we will get a warning that actually FCPU is not defined but should be defined for delay.h and it still will continue because it has a safety fallback here and will assume then that our CPU is running at, I had to count the zeros for a second here, at 1 megahertz. Um, so the code will compile but it will give you an, a warning message um, if this is not here. So if we comment this one out and recompile our code, then we get this yellow message and down here we get a warning fcpu not defined for util.h. So we go back here and we activate the define again and then our delays should be correct again um, based on that our cpu is running at 8 megahertz and no error message down here. But now let's, so what did I do? I s reduced the delay from 500 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. And uh, so what happens? Yeah, everything should go five times faster. So let's see if this is the case. I'll give you the uh, view of my hand and our numbers here. And I will try to find my avia dudes. It's here and I will program the new code. And it's, it already looks a little bit more fluent, but uh, it's still yeah not steady. And so uh, we go and make it a little bit faster, yet a little bit faster. We make it another five times faster. So we go from 100 to 20 milliseconds delay here. Um, we compile our code. You get to look at the camera. I get to maneuver the reset button and the program button. 
and now we have a very flickery display it actually is a bit more flickery on this camera than it is to my eyes but it's still quite flickery um, so let's make it even faster um, let's go to well what is five times faster than 20 four so we go for four milliseconds intervals and I transition you over here and we press the reset button, program the new code. And now we have a very interesting interference pattern between our camera and the display frequency. But I can tell you with my eye, it's a very steady 3210 right now 3210 on the display actually i can see no flicker at all with my eyes um, let's just try a last one with just one millisecond delay and uh, this is actually something which it was encouraged in, in the lab instructions i can also tell you that yes um, well two hours for this lab without talking all the time it is enough but with actually explaining everything it, it it's get a bit yeah but we will yeah i, I don't know I'm, apart from the short problems which we had everything so far went fine and we didn't have any zoom problems isn't that great um so now it's even steady for the camera um there, there seems to be some uh pattern running over it because of some interference but uh yeah, this is now what what kind of screen update rate do we have now? Uh, we leave. I have to look at what 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 was the latest thing I wrote here. So we have a delay of one millisecond. Each of these instructions is a fraction of a microsecond. So it goes quite fast, and then it waits for a millisecond. So we have essentially after four milliseconds we come back to the first uh, number. So we have one millisecond two milliseconds three milliseconds four milliseconds then it's back here and that means that we have an update rate of 250 hertz and uh, this is definitely fast enough to not be seen by the human eye um, actually from 20 hertz on it starts to disappear and at four milliseconds we have this interference pattern only with the camera and not with my eye so this is how these displays work and what you can do in software on, in controlling these. The next lab will actually upload, outload or transition all of this code from being in the main loop into an interrupt service routine. Uh, the refresh rate right now was 250 hertz, roughly. Ah, ganz, quite, quite exactly 250 hertz. The calculation is um, let me let me switch back to this camera here. Um, so it take it we have one millisecond which we spend on each of the four displays. So in order to show everything, we have four milliseconds. So four milliseconds for the whole display for all four digits, and that means that n is one second divided by four milliseconds which is one thousand divided by four which is 250 hertz um, so that, that's how you can calculate this okay our marathon has come to an end four hours with you guys today um, everything worked i had fun connecting this stuff here um, actually this is something which i normally don't have during this course because um, i'm running around between all of the student groups and uh, helping out but now i can connect everything myself um, but if we will remove the, the yeah you can try that later but we, we yeah if you want to yes we we can do this uh, I just wanted to have my last words here for today, but okay, um, I will do that. Uh, let's get rid of the delay altogether and compile the code. 
start the oscilloscope <laughs> because we will not be able to know exactly what the uh, frequency is we go we reset this one here and we program the new code and uh, there we have it it appears to be a little bit dimmer um, and this is because more relatively more time is spent without actually having the LEDs turned on per cycle but how fast is it our oscilloscope can help us here I will connect myself to one of the digits and we know that all of the digits are uh, a little bit tight here hmm. okay I will disconnect this digit move it over here and let's have a look what the oscilloscope has to say it, it's not 8 mega no it's not 8 megahertz because 8 megahertz is the instruction clock cycle um, but we need several instructions for getting uh, through the for loop and uh, it, it's not yeah it, it's much dimmer yes but it actually if you look at our code um, transition here if you look at our code then actually the digits are off here off here and first switched on here so during these two operations there's nothing shown on the LEDs they are switched on here and then we already return back after some comparison and some uh, decrement of the counter uh, so there's very short time um, when the LEDs are actually on in comparison to the whole cycle but this is the fastest cycling which we can get and uh, this is actually let me see let me switch to ninja transition so this is how now let me switch off this light here um, how it looks on the oscilloscope and uh, since I'm on the segment now on, on the digit line um, during the zero here the LED for this particular segment is on and then it's off and then it's on again because we are returning to the same digit and we have up here 10 microseconds but even easier is that our oscilloscope actually calculate so up here we have 10 microseconds per centimeter but our oscilloscope calculates actually or measures the frequency for us so it's right now updating at 67 kilohertz so this would be 8 megahertz divided by the four digits and we are at 2 megahertz at maximum and uh, then from 2 megahertz down to 67 kilohertz tells you something like how much time is spent in the individual instructions actually i would say it, it's still it, it sounds a bit much but let let's see um, we are at one microsecond per centimeter now so the leds are actually on for 1.5 microseconds and uh, then they are off well i move this one here they are off for 2.5 microseconds uh, no no we are now at five so this is five ten this this would be 13 or 14 microseconds so on for two microseconds and then off for 14 or 15 microseconds and now it's 0 0.067 mega if it's 67 kilohertz um it was it shows 67 kilohertz here and i'm trying to see yeah i mean 10 microseconds would be 100 kilohertz so we have yeah it, it seems reasonable um i'm slightly surprised that it is this low given the fact that there's almost nothing in our loop so i'm actually not completely sure what eats up all our processor cycles right now um, we will have a look at exactly this later on when we are looking into interrupt service routines 
um, because you cannot measure it with an oscilloscope I will do show you some things on an oscilloscope and how we can actually use an oscilloscope to debug circuits and, and see how long an interrupt surface routine is working but I'm, I'm a bit puzzled I'll have to do some calculations um, but uh, for us and for today that's it and uh, we, we really exceeded our time now I will put up this recording as well on Studium and then as I said I, I still hope that we can get the boxes this week so that you could do this yourself soon hopefully sure you can some close-up view here Thank you for uh, staying with me for four hours and 10 minutes today. Uh, well, actually, yeah, quarter past, it will be four real time hours. And uh, yeah, see you.